defined in three ways. It's a shared way of life defined by characteristic features or attitudes, goals and practices. And um, we always feel like, for Africa Brew, this is the most perfect way of explaining this. Um, it's about developing expert care and training with the capacity for learning and interchanging knowledge for future brewers. Uh, this is why we get together here. We share information freely. It's nice to chat. It's nice to have beers. And it's really just a fantastic experience getting to taste and see a whole lot of different opinions about certain aspects. And then, of course, it's about propagating living material, which is our microbiological technique of culturing the organisms on an artificial media. So we are from the Department of Microbial, Biochemical and Food Biotechnology at the University of the Free State. We started about three years ago as kind of a joint venture with the university with an effort to um, build up the culture collection, the biodiversity of South Africa. So the department has started about 50 years ago and its primary focus back in those days was on fermentation sciences. And um, they've completed hundreds of research projects with breweries across the world and um, they've collected an insane amount of isolates. There are currently over 2,000 isolates of yeasts in the university's culture collection. Some of them were literally isolated from the tops of Everest, from the digestive tract of butterflies in the Amazon, and of course from a lot of breweries across the world that um, needed expert opinions and wanted to work on some of their fermentation. So we've been working with the university in a part-time capacity, trying to develop these cultures and make them commercially available to the brewing community. So yeah, like I said, the U.S. collaboration with Liquid Culture is for development and commercialization. We currently rent lab space from there, and that's basically where we're based. So, with the topic of today, I'm here to talk about, about sweet and sour. Um, as Megan said, intentionally brewing sour beers, not um, <laughs> <laughs> accidental sour beers that often happen. And I'm um, going to keep it very simple, just going to talk lactic, acetic, and then just something that's just wild. So, um, this has already been covered quite a bit. Um, Bruce gave an extensive history lesson on this in Belgium. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because you give Errol shit about his very complex microbiological pathways, but history. Damn it. <laughs> 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 a wide variety of sour beers in South Africa, and I mean, obviously worldwide. Just Google the language of the creek. And um, lesser known, this is Sutu of Nkoboti. Nkoboti. Um, who, I see her anymore. Oh, she had to go home. She had to go home. Who's done extensive research on that. Uh, Errol's also worked with students at the university where they did a complete microbiological analysis from the start of the brew to the end to see how the micro uh, microbiological populations flow into each other, which populations have very important impacts in the beginning and in the middle and the end. And it basically all depends on the kinds of sugars that are available and the way that they kind of dovetail off of each other. But that's a whole other presentation for another time. Um, they all have one thing in common though. All of these beers are exposed to the environment and they're spontaneously inoculated. As we've said, this is absolutely great when you're living in Stellenbosch or Franschhoek and you've got cool ships and things like that. Mm. Joburg and Bluefontein aren't that prime for no. inoculating from the natural no. environment. No. We basically just get a kilogram of dust in our beer. <laughs> Or, or we've checked. We've checked. There's what nothing is, in there. What about Sabunda and Sasselburn? No. 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 <laughs> right. we, haven't, we haven't traveled that far to do that kind of experimentation. But um, yeah, what so that's basically what you're saying. So for everyone, a natural spontaneous ferment, uh, fermentation isn't really an option. I mean, you can try it, but your results will be very uh, variable. Yeah, variable like you can't even believe. So, um, so the barrels or pots in which these things are done, also you can see a micrograph on the right, which shows the porous surface of one of these pots, and you can see the yeast with the bacteria sitting on the yeast, and I mean, the close proximity, that's just how they live. So while the yeast is producing one thing, the bacteria is feeding off of that, and vice versa, in this extremely complex environment. So this consortium of different microbes metabolize simultaneously and successively, and for instance, in a lab, you can get over 2,000 different strains of microorganisms that are successively and um, right after each other and before each other, they're fermenting these things. And it's an extremely complex environment. Where's the so tokens? <laughs> <laughs> you're ready, you're ready got the... <laughs> so one guy's buying tokens and he and you know. It's, it's a very loving environment. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, the main thing is we're focusing on the mm -hmm. same piece of Britannomyces and the lactic acid bacteria, such as lactobacillus and pediococcus. Pediococcus is a bit of a bitch to grow, trust me, we've tried several times. 
and they die for no reason. Apparently, they can survive on any kind of brewing equipment when you don't want them there, but the minute you try and propagate them, they die. They say no. Yeah, no, that's not, no. No. So that's yeah, also quite useful. So as also has been covered a lot, um, all of the drawbacks to these spontaneously fermented sours, especially if you're a commercial brewery in South Africa and you want to have a kind of sour offering for the client. So it's more time consuming um, for the complex kind of sour beers compared to pure culture fermented and obviously it can take years to ferment something like this. Now if you've got a nice big brewery and you've got space, you know, you brew it, you put it in barrels and you leave it in the corner and you kind of forget about it. But I mean, for like our brewery, Megan, you guys, I'm not sure how much space you've got just to leave barrels lying around. No. And um, because we're working with other people at all times, you kind of get into shit when things are just standing around. So you're trying to avoid that time gap all the time. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thanks, boss man. <laughs> so, um, so one of the big problems is if you're just putting something into a barrel, yes, it's got a big surface area, but in comparison to just inoculating what you're trying to ferment, it's a very low inoculum that you're using, and the lack of this microbial representation leads to a very slow fermentation. Then, of course, you've got many restraining factors like ethanol, pH, carbon dioxide, substrate deprivation, intermicrobial competition for these nutrients. All of these, I mean, yes, they add to the complexity of the, sh of the sour, but it also takes a lot of time to get it right. So, yeah, long-term storage of barrels take up space, a number of microbial strains are involved, and this represents another challenge because it's complicated to control these collective metabolisms and the competitions, and that leads to a very big variation in your consistency. So you might brew an awesome sour, but doing that again is really difficult. And now that's where blending comes in. You've got a whole assortment of barrels, and you can choose and try and get it as close as possible. But that's one of the major issues. So for today, I'd like to just talk about how we as home brewers or smaller breweries can kind of bypass the complexity to get a more consistent product, it won't have the same kind of depth, but, um, yeah, I'm sorry, the picture obviously got distorted. It says, do not open wood souring in progress. <laughs> For if, if you're sharing lab space, that's a uh, really important thing. Um, as covered by Megan, very thoroughly mash, mash souring, kettle souring, uh, simply adding lactic acid. This, of course, all leads, uh, leads to a little bit of a lack in your depth of flavor that you can develop, but um, the results are very fast, and you can get a lot more consistency out of your product. So, brewing sours are what we call just controlling the contamination, which is basically all that we're trying to do here. So you need to understand these organisms. So lactobacillus, as mentioned, is a bacteria. It grows much faster than yeast, a lot faster. They, are, um, they grow at high temperatures, but they're very specific for the temperature at which they grow. So, like in a, you know, usually we can go one or plus one or plus two degrees or minus two degrees. It doesn't really matter too much. But for bacteria, you'd be amazed at the amount of difference that you get in the results depending on how consistently you can control the temperature. Now, as the lactobacillus produces mainly lactic acid, um, as Megan said, you can just add lactic acid, but it loses the complete depth of flavor. And as Carol explained yesterday, if you can look at the complex biochemistry behind that, with the esters and the microbes and all of the interactions, just adding lactic acid simply isn't going to cut it. You still need the bioreactor, the yeast or the bacteria to convert all of these reactions. So, Britonomyces, it's obviously the bring the funk organism. Very few people have really, in depth, tried to brew with this. Um, generally, it's because people are scared of the contamination. Personally, we, we're not that scared. You can kill them quite easily as long as they don't give them too many nukes and crannies, or you can just, like, Bruce, just chuck out your fermenter. Which is fine when you've got that energy. <laughs> 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 now, interesting thing about Britonomyces is you get so many different results depending on how you use it. So Brecht, as a primary fermenter, you've brewed your wort, you've got all of your stuff, and you just added Britonomyces as a primary fermenter. It's amazing how clean it comes out. It doesn't produce that high level of hay and horse blanket, and all of those. And in the end, it's actually a pretty clean beer, and with a very subtle amount of the wild funk that you can imagine. But at Brecht, at the end of a primary fermentation, after using something like Saccharomyces, and the amount of funk just goes through the roof. And it's all about that competition. So in the beginning, it's got zero competition. It doesn't need to produce all of the other things to kind of hide away its energy sources and various things that it can use later. So if it's got a complete monopoly over the sugar, it just does what normal yeast does. It makes alcohol and it eats sugar. So bread helps to develop an extreme depth of flavor. And yeah, the flavor isn't for everyone. But if you learn to appreciate the amount of things that it can do, 
it really adds to your experience of the beer as well. Now, this is a long process. Typically, I mean, even if you're using Brex, your primary fermenter, and you over pitch it, you're still going to wait two or three days before it really starts picking up. You're going to wait another week or two for the primary fermentation to even reach kind of a plateau where it's going to go. And then it takes a long time to really develop the flavor afterwards. So patience is key. Many brewers have got patience, some have got absolutely none. So it's important to you know, throttle your expectations of how quickly it's going to go. Now, as Harold also mentioned, um, Brettanomyces has the ability to produce acetic acid. Now, acetic acid, generally, is not something you want in a beer, but in something like a Flanders Red, it's an amazing, in a very small undertone. You must only barely get it in the back of the throat. So, that's a small amount of aeration, especially as home brewers. I mean, it's almost impossible to keep all oxygen out. It's not what it's about. So, you don't have to intentionally add anything. Just through general practices that we use, a little bit of oxygen is going to get introduced and you're going to produce that little bit of acetic acid that you want. If your fermenter is going open, you've got oxygen going in there all the time, it's going to turn into vinegar, which, trust me, right, we also work in the vinegar industry, it's not that easy to get the levels of acetic acid that you actually want. So, um, it's just going to ruin it and it's going to have absolutely no application over your salad. <laughs> so, strain selection is extremely important. Um, you get, yes, Lee. Uh, carry on, just before you change to the next slide, I'm going to add something. All right, Bosley. So, for your strain selection is very important. Various Britannomyces can do different things. Now, something that a uh, few people tend to omit, now if you've looked at the American sour scene, you know you get these heavily fruited fruit puree Berliner Weiss Britannomyces lacto, um, especially with a lot of lactose added for the sweetness because it goes so dry. But some breads can ferment lactose. So if you're just going to add lactose to your cans or to your bottles, you omit the fact that the Britannomyces are going to eat that, Boom. and yeah, really a spectacular bottle bomb. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's just such a waste. So choosing the strain of Britannomyces is easily available on the internet. You can just Google which Britannomyces can eat lactobus, um, lactobus, sorry, lactic acid and lactose. So carefully select which ones you use. Uh, Britannomyces lambicus, obviously, really wild, really that typical lambic funk that you get. Bruxelliensis is a little bit more in the middle, and then you get Calceni, which is right at the bottom. Very restrained kind of Britannomyces funk. So if you just want a light, for instance, with Errol's, I don't know we had Errol's Brett's Berliner, using the right uh, Britannomyces just gives you a hint. It doesn't take you into the next stratospheric region of no, the amount no, of weight really loss that you're taking. <laughs> so, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, as we said, uh, minimizing the amount of O2 that gets exposed really controls the acetic acid portion. Lee? Lee? Lee wants to ask you. Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Please, please. Mm -hmm. I, just, I just want to say, I'm so glad you used controlling the contamination and not inoculation like you're doing something good. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce, um, you and Jake are just keeping in a corner somewhere. I'm just doing cynical or that. Uh, they do write the document. That's fine. You refuse to be inoculated. Uh, so, um, like I said, I'm here to talk about some brewing applications. Um, the most important factor when you're going to decide on brewing a sour is you really need to define your own style which you want to brew. You're not going to go for, I'm just going to brew a general parallel word and I'm going to brew in some lactobacillus or something. Really decide on what you want and then tailor make uh, the kind of process that you want to follow and your final result. So if you ever want to brew a sour, you're unsure, give either myself or Errol a call and we'll tell you exactly, we'll ask you, what do you want in the final product? So uh, Megan um, explained that it's nice to add certain fruits with a lot of tartness. Adding tart on top of lactic acid sourness really goes very sour in the mouth. Sometimes it's nice to use a certain fruit that isn't, doesn't have an extra tartaric acid influence and you just want light sourness and easy drinkability. I think the Paranormal from OC was a good example of that mm, where yes, very. it's a very nice introduction to a sour. Where you get the sour component, but it's not going to claw you, it's not going to make you pull your face. So it's all about what you want in the end and then tell them making your recipe and your micro design to get to that kind of place. So for a Berliner Weiss, for instance, which is a very, very easy beer to brew, and it's fast, but Megan already touched on this so much, I'm just going to skip over. It's fast to sour, it's clean, and it's a fresh, lactic sour. 
even if just a normal banana bites without adding fruit, it's your most typical lawnmower beer you can get. It's kind of like drinking a castle light. You're not going to taste every sip. You're going to have the first taste, yeah, it's exactly what I remember, and then you're going to down the rest. <laughs> and that's kind of what you want from a Berliner Weiss. It's mm -hmm. supposed to be very sessionable, and you just have one sip and you follow in. Mm -hmm. um, the nice thing also is you only need the lactic acid bacteria. Of course, with the Philly Sour, that's made it so much easier to do that kind of thing. You can ferment it nice and warm. It's not that sensitive. So really, really quick, you don't even need to do the extra kettle sour anymore. But kettle souring is awesome if you want to get another depth of flavor and if you also want to really dive into the lower pHs for the ones who really like the extra tart. So I'm going to focus more on brewing of Flanders today, which is a more complex sour, it takes more time, it's got multiple organisms, and I'm going to look at the difference between, for instance, the Rodenbach that's brewed with a very wild consortium, versus if you just want to brew one in your garage and you want to get kind of where Flanders is going, but without all of the 2,000 microorganisms we need to achieve that. So I'm not going to touch on this, I just want to talk about the pedicle, which is the prettiest part for me about brewing uh, <laughs> brewing uh, Berliner. So a uh, lactic acid pedicle is this nice, fluffy, um, in the beginning obviously it's a nightmare when you don't know. Before. <laughs> <laughs> Intentionally getting that pedicle. <laughs> <laughs> the fluffy, calorie surface really is an indication that your fermentation is going well and the lactose are doing what they want. Our general procedure is after mashing we just boil for 15 minutes just to make sure that we don't get any of the other things that were in the grain before we have the lactobacillus. We always prefer lactobacillus brevis. It's uh, what we found to be the fastest souring, it gives a nice complex kind of sour, but uh, it's, it's not so full of shit when it comes to temperature control and things like that. Generally between 35 and 38, and you're going to get a perfectly normal sour within 48, uh, 24 to 48 hours. Um, it's important to contain the, as constant a temperature as possible, and it will drop your pH from 3.2 to 3.7, depending on where you want it to stop. I was also going to mention what Megan said, don't do what uh, Trevor Gentles from Cape Town always says, he just does the tung tippy toots when he did the apricot sour and the apple He was just, he was phoning me every two hours, he said, no, I just tasted it, it doesn't taste sour. It's like, Trevor, there's a crap load of sugar in there, you're not going to taste the sour. Where's your pH probe? And his pH probe was completely murtu, so in the end we just went with, just leave it for 48 hours and then go on. <laughs> so it's important to measure your pH with alternatives. That was a question. And it was also an example of using a new style to people. Um, oh, and another thing, so you don't always have to just go USFI afterwards or typical ale yeast. There are different kinds of saccharomyces. So we've got saccharomyces brutaliensis trap, which is amazing for introducing an extra layer of tartness. So it ferments really dry. It's also kind of what you would call a wild yeast, and it finishes really dry, and it gives an extra layer of uh, fruity complexity that you don't generally get from other yeast. Okay, so let's talk just a little bit about brewing of Flanders. If you want to do a more similar one, yeah, no, I mean it is. Like we spend a crap load of money on buying bread and butter, but it's always nice when you can just brew something. So we're going to try and simplify this as much as possible so you don't need a barrel, you don't need to have the um, Rizlari blend from Y yeast. I mean, obviously it's an awesome blend that you can buy, but you can never re-pitch it because the amount of microorganisms change. So let's just try and break it down to two organisms. So we're going to use lactobacillus and bread mainly. You're, you're going to use quite a robust granule, a combination of light and more dark malts, but your moderately keel malts are the perfect place to go. You don't have to go and decoct the crap out of it to try and get the color in. It's all about the taste. And uh, what we found is using an old unmalted wheat leaves a lot of residual sugars that couldn't be converted. But the bacteria will be able, along with the Britannomyces, to convert those in a slow fashion and lead to a bit more of a depth and flavor. Obviously, very low hop additions. Um, I myself am not a fan of a lot of hops with sour. And um, you can add just normal wood chips. Buy some wood chips from any of the local homebrew stores. Don't use too many, just like one or two chips in there because it's going to be steeping in there for a long time. You don't want something that goes too much into the barrel range. And um, of course you can add some fruits. Uh, the most popular would be cherries or raspberries. Once again, go very light. You just want a little tinge of color and a little bit of flavor. So quite so a few guys add um, grapes or, or Yeah, that's part of the, 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 part of the fruit of addition, yeah. So you can definitely add that. Um, it would add another layer of complexity within the microorganisms. Because we're going to just shorten the, the process to get some of those winey flavors. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If you add in cherries, do you add the pips as well? I don't like adding the pips, but the pips will add 
I've got more than enough of the kind of flavors that the soaps would impart after a long time just from normal from the malt and kill them. And when you add fruit, are you doing anything to it? I just have juice. I love jam. Ah! Yeah! 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 And the color stays a little bit more, it doesn't just go brown. Which, I mean, in fact, that's fine, you don't have to. I prefer doing it because it kills off any potential mm. other organisms mm. that could be present there. Because, I mean, we're not going to buy fresh cherries from Pittsburgh, maybe it's just a frozen pack we get from some guy's freezer. Mm. So we try and limit the amount of exposure to a different amount of microorganisms. Anyway, so after you've made all of this, you can just co pitch both. So now you're adding lactobacillus and the bread. Don't expect the fastest kind of fermentation right off from the start. Um, it's going to take a while. The lactic, the lactic acid bacteria are now colder than they like to be, so they're going to take a long time. You've got the Britannomyces, which has got a slow start. Um, obviously, you can add a small amount of just normal ale yeast, um, whether it be liquid of uh, USO5 or the LC16 or anything of those, just to kind of get rid of 50 to 60 percent of the sugars before the Britannomyces really kicks in. Just kind of limits the amount of fun. But as mentioned with Bruce's. Um, primary fermented bread, it's going to be quite clean, so you don't have to worry too much about having too much fun. So you go pitch them after cooling, and then you allow it to ferment for a long time. It, yeah. Uh, so, do you find, when you mash, do you prefer to mash high temperature or low? I like higher. High so, if you look at, let's look at like a type example of uh, a blend is like if you look at the Roten yeah. Generally it's got a nice deep caramelly sweetness. Yeah. So a nice high mash temperature, you get a lot of unfermented sugars, like you said, get your strike water right, because you don't want it to even be too low for too long. Yeah. Get the strike water right. And it's going to take the microorganisms a lot longer to eat those um, branched sugars that are still left within your wort. Do they create more flavors when they're eating? Definitely. The harder they have to work, the more flavors they're going to create. Okay. It's like, kind of like us. If you're, if you're working hard, you're creating I mean, extra flavors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so make them work for it. Um, then, of course, it's still an acid acid production due to the low temperature. The fun will only really start appearing once the sugar concentration gets a little bit lower. And then aging is important because it just kind of fuses all of the flavors together. Like, uh, like we said, you can just add lactic acid, but it's always kind of like lactic acid and the rest. It never quite incorporates itself. So the age is very, very important. Okay, so just a few things that we've learned from the sour fermentations um, over the last year. Water profile has had a massive influence. Um, for instance, like I've told a few people in Bloemfontein, our tap water is pH 9. That's, that's where it comes out. What? What? Yeah. Even, even after reverse osmosis, it's pretty fine. So, it's, it's, a, it's rough. So it's important to check your mash water, make sure that you work at the right pH, especially for converting, converting your starches. The pH is very important. Bacteria are more sensitive to these environmental factors, such as pH, chemical composition, and minerals. So, I have kind of an idea for brewing water, but I mean most of you have good brewing water, so it's not too much of an issue. And then, of course, the importance of maintaining your fermentation temperature. As I mentioned, bacteria are very specific. Accurate means fast. So if you can get lactobacillus and you keep it at 37, there's going to be a 24-hour uh, sour souring, and you're going to be done. You don't even have to worry about the rest. So keeping the temperature is very accurate, and that's why we also like doing it in the grain folder. You just set it to the temperature, it's pretty accurate, and it can just keep doing what it does. Patience, as mentioned, as uh, Megan mentioned, patience is important in brewing. <laughs> if you're not going to be, if you don't need to have a commercial batch out by next week, don't stress. Put your microorganisms in there, let them do their stuff. As you saw with Errol's talk yesterday, the amount of time that your beer spends on the yeast is extremely important for converting all of the extra products into the final products, converting those into esters. Really important. Don't be. <laughs> Just be lactic, you know, just be... <laughs> 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 Don't worry about the lag time. When working with microorganisms such as these, especially with the Britannomyces, there can be a lot of lag time. Be patient, just let it take all of what it's doing. It is going to start eventually, and once it starts, it's just going to be a nice slow roll and you can't stop it. I mean, what's the point of being scared of Britannomyces getting into everything, and then when you actually pitch it, now you're worried it's not going to work? <laughs> so speed does not necessarily correlate with quality. You can sometimes have a very quick sour that's amazing, and other times you can leave something for six months and it's still going to be crap. Problem with sours is consistency is hard. So you have to keep working at it, keep it aside, even if it's not quite what you want. Keep it aside, you can blend it with something else later. And the more time that passes, the better. Um, 
especially with Brettanomyces, the longer the time it's allowed in contact with those sugars, the more it's going to change. And even if something is bad at a certain point, it will eventually get to a really nice place. So choose your microorganisms wisely. It's very important because if you go with something that's going to be too wild, your beer is obviously going to turn out too wild eventually. So choose that carefully. So um, I'm going to skip for the thumbs up. If you ever need any advice for the yeast or anything like that, um, my number is going to be on the next slide. Just take a picture. You can phone us or email us at any time if you need any advice on your fermentations, whether it be clean or wild or wherever you need to go. For those of you who have worked with us, you know generally we're quite quick on the phone. If you've got questions, you need anything, we're there for you. So thank you. No, good. Uh, I just want to ask if you actually lecture for a career or is this? You... No, he no. doesn't. No, 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 no. That's uh, Dr. Kaysen's job. He really doesn't. <laughs> well done, Thanks, guys. Really well done. Well done. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But let's be quick because we're running out of time. Has everyone ordered their meal?